yes, uh, to kick off this conversation, I uh, have invited these three knowledgeable ladies uh, to give insights from their field of work. I then uh, start uh, from uh, Annela, Anger Gravi is, is probably a name uh, quite uh, known at least in Estonia who take interest in, in climate issues. Uh, her list of credentials is, is quite extensive, so I, <laughs> I'll, I just uh, picked uh, some. Um, she's a climate scientist, um, University of Cambridge, um, also United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, CEO for Cambridge Trust for New Thinking in Economics. A warm hand of applause. Thank you. Uh, and then we have our guest uh, from Finland, uh, uh, Eva Daimisto, uh, who is now leading uh, a sustainable uh, business in Milton, sustainable business consultation in, in Milton, uh, but has uh, previously worked uh, in, in Stura Enzo, which is a big uh, forest company, I'd say. Ecosystem. Yep. Uh, so has uh, e extensive uh, corporate um, experience. Warm welcome to her. <laughs> and then we have uh, Aire Riha, uh, who is advisor to the management in the Ministry of Climate. Um, and soon, as I understood, uh, becoming uh, directly responsible for green transition process uh, in the ministry. Uh, educational background in economics, but has uh, worked pretty much all the time in the environmental sector. Um, has been Estonia's representative in uh, United Nations Environment Program, initiator and chief negotiator for nature-based solutions resolution in uh, UN. Welcome, Aira. So b before the first question, I I'll, I'll just give this uh, background that uh, um, I must say this uh, suggestion to have greenwashing as a debate topic in Armos Festival came from my colleague Andra. And I was not too enthusiastic in the beginning, but then after uh, having looked into the figures, uh, I realized that, yeah, this is big and, and this potentially has bad consequences for the future economy. Um, a study commissioned a few years back uh, by European Commission found that uh, some 50% of green claims that companies make are uh, either misleading or totally unfounded. So that, in turn, of course, creates mistrust, which we can also see is, is illustrated by another uh, survey. Um, this is in the US, uh, where the younger generation, Generation Z, is, is not trusting um, claims, green claims from brands. It's more than 80% do not trust. Well, we obviously have a problem when uh, there is so much uh, mistrust in the economic sector. On the other hand, we see big money flowing into the sector. Mm, uh, the asset managers globally are expected to increase their ESG-related assets to more than $30 trillion by a few years, a uh, uh, few years' time. So this is, if you look at the global um, GDP, I think last year it was um, around 100 trillion. And if we see that uh, the asset managers are now playing with roughly third of that amount, and there might be uh, a whole lot of uh, scam in it, then obviously there is a big problem for the economy. Um, so, so that, I think, is, is the kind of point of departure for this uh, 
discussion. And, uh, and that brings me to my uh, first question. Um, it is that uh, I think many of us have flown somewhere, had our package delivered, ordered food, and then we see this proud statement that uh, this service, uh, activity, product, is CO2 free. Right. We don't know, uh, I mean, I often don't know if that actually holds true, uh, but, but my first question actually, just to clear the ground is, and then starting maybe with Annela, is uh, what do these terms actually mean? When, when a company says that something is CO2 free, they are CO2 neutral, some even say they are CO2 negative, and some are even CO2 positive. Can you bring some clarity here so that we are right on these concepts? Yeah, thank, thank, does it work? Yep. Um, thank you, Maris, and I think it's a very, very good question. Um, and it's good to clarify that, these things. Often, often uh, people don't know because you can't see what exactly happened, why, why they claim it. There's no explanation to that. So what's the problem? We're talking about CO2, but it's, we can talk about any greenhouse gas. Um, um, let's, let's just recap, take a couple of steps back and see, you know, talk about climate change. What is climate change? Um, so climate change is caused by burning fossil fuels. That's the main cause. So that means that we're taking, there's, the fossil fuels are stored under, under, under the Earth's surface, that we can talk about coal, lignite, um, oil shale, oil, natural gas, that is, by the way, green fuel in taxonomy, but it's actually not green. We can talk about that as well. So, and if we take these fuels out and burn them for energy, either move our cars, airplanes, then we add CO2 molecules to the atmosphere. So, uh, and if we add CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, we cause climate change. So that's the invisible problem we have. And why are we causing climate change? The reason is that CO2 molecules have this very good property to trap heat. Um, so if the sun warms the Earth's surface and this warmth, as, as reflected back as um, long wave radiation, then CO2 molecules trap it and reflect it back. So without CO2 in the atmosphere, the average temperature of the Earth would be minus 18 degrees annually, but it's currently plus 15. So it's a very, very good thing to have it, and it's called greenhouse gas effect. But the problem is that before we started using coal, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, the concentrations were between 260 and 280 particles per million. So you take the water out of the atmosphere, you just count the molecules, and then you count CO2 molecules. Currently, it's around four, 415. So uh, we have increased CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, but that also means they trap more heat, and that means that we have formed the Earth's climate system, and that causes all sorts of problems. More extreme events, more um, droughts, for example, more storms, um, more heat waves that we have seen this summer, and that causes damage. It also damages people, damages the nature. So it's very briefly. And the property of CO2 molecules is such that if you emit them here, for example, from this tent, we have this light bulbs here, burning uh, this electricity most likely comes from, from oil shale. So, and for getting this electricity, CO2 is emitted. So these are equally, or more or less equally distributed around the globe. It doesn't matter where you emit those. So what we want to do is to reduce those emissions and stabilize CO2 concentrations in atmosphere. So, and the, hence you get that like when you buy a product, you do care whether for that product, for producing that product, any fossil fuels are burnt. So if there's no fossil fuels burnt for that product, or even if you take the entire life cycle of that product, no fossil fuels are used, you can say that it's CO2 free. If any CO2 is, is emitted during the production of that product, and then these emissions are offset, that means that you plant the equal amount of forest that will trap the equal amount of CO2, then you can say it's CO2 neutral. So if then 
you actually trap more than CO2 molecules than you used for producing the particular product, then you can say it's CO2 negative. If it's a little bit less, it's CO2 positive. So basically what you want to know is, is the product I'm buying good for the climate system? And is the CO2 there, is it somehow reduced somewhere else? Or maybe there were no CO2 emissions at all. So you want to be really climate friendly, and this is where it comes from. And I hope I answered the question. It's a very long answer, sorry for that. But uh, Yeah. Um, so, so my question in that sense remains, uh, there was a good explanation of these uh, four categories. Um, would you then say that it's even theoretically possible that that th there is a product or service that, for example, is, 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 is carbon uh, negative, carbon positive. Because d during the life cycle of the whole production, uh, given the economic model that we have, it might be to, yeah. In theory, it's possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In theory, everything <laughs> is possible, more yeah. or less everything, isn't it? In practice, it's very, very difficult given mm. the current um, economic system we have and supply chains. Yeah. So um, I think ne negative free is very difficult. Negative is easier because then you need to trap more CO2 emissions. But even then, you know, if you say you planted X amount of trees, how certain can you be that these same trees are not affected by climate change and that, they've, and that they will capture CO2? So in practice, it's very, very difficult. In theory, of course, it's possible, given that we have now new technologies coming available. It also depends which product you produce, isn't it? Some products require less CO2, some products are very CO2 intensive to produce. So, so would you say that if uh, um, we see one of those three state, uh, four statements, uh, we should be definitely cautious when uh, they say that it is it is free, it is positive. Um, if it's offset and they claim it's neutral, it's, it's quite, it, it might be right. But it's the same as if it's positive, probably they're more honest in this case. That means that they have, the product is related to some CO2 emissions. But it's rather like, you know, less offset than it actually emitted CO2 during the production process. Can you bring an example? Um, if you take, if you take a flight, let's say I'm not going to use Ryan, uh, 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 okay, let's take a Ryanair flight for example, and you offset half of your emissions, then you can say you have a positive, uh, positive um, flight because you did not offset all emissions, so it's not neutral. Whether you can trust it, it depends how much you trust the company, how much they meet uh, different uh, requirements, reporting. Uh, whether they have any standards, uh, um, management, um, greenhouse gas management standards, and so on. And whether you, then you can trust even that process. And I'm sure everyone knows more about that, that, uh, that these, these regulations and related to companies. Um, yeah, b before we, we continue with how, how the companies are actually like choosing between their um, pathways, um, I'll, I'll also put this question of, of greenwashing um, to uh, get your sort of definition of what greenwashing is and, and what type of harm it causes. Um, Anna, I can start and then I move to Eva. Yeah. So greenwashing is if you make a claim and it's actually not true, let's put it very simple. So you make a claim that your product is CO2 neutral, it's actually not, but because we as, as consumers can't control it, so um, we trust the producer, and if they actually don't do what they promised to do, or if anything happens during that process, then you end up with cross, uh, the greenwashing. And what it does is that you, know, you, you, you claim that you emitted less emissions, so therefore you can claim that there's less harm caused by climate change, but actually it's not. It's just there for you to sell your products to those people who care. It's a sort uh, of layman's, probably there's more, more official definitions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Eva, I will, I will uh, move on to you uh, with a little bit uh, same question. Um, but I've come to understand that 
there are more like delicate um, types of greenwashing. Uh, one, as Anna described, is that you, you state, claim something, uh, you're not, so you're lying outright, but, but often some companies do see ways that, for example, they, they pick up something in their portfolio that they perform well. Uh, but on the other hand, they keep on doing the bad stuff in the background. So it's, it's not outrightly lying, because the thing that they do good is good, it's very fine. But uh, in the backdrop, you know, they keep on doing the ugly thing. So this is mo more like hidden and delicate ways of, of greenwashing. Um, you have been in corporate world, um, continue to be so. <laughs> um, have you come across these issues? Um, I don't know wh whether in your own company, um, with your competitors, uh, share something. Yeah. Can you hear me, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, in greenwashing lingo, that's called um, selective disclosures or hidden trade-offs. And what that means is that, as you said, you talk about the things you have in order and the stuff that you're not ready to talk about, you just don't talk about. And I think when I started in sustainability communications and reporting some 15 years ago, I was benchmarking reports, sustainability reports and websites all day, every day. And I remember, Back in the days, many international mining companies were talking a lot about community involvement and community investment, like how they support local schools and local football clubs, etc. And they didn't say a word about biodiversity. And we know that open mines are, they, they cause nature loss. They have very significant biodiversity impacts, but you couldn't find a word about that in their reports or on their website. So I think that would be an example. It's still happening today, but I think both companies and customers, both B2B and B2C customers, have become more cautious about this. And, and sort of, I think the level of understanding is higher than it was 15 years ago. So um, it still happens, but it's a little bit more sophisticated maybe uh, today. Did I answer your question, by the way? Yes. Um, I, I was just. Um, um, trying to maybe get some examples also. I mean, you don't have to name a company, <laughs> but, but some, um, yeah. I mean, fr from, from uh, uh, internet, we can all look up uh, some uh, great greenwashing cases, but, but something, uh, um, something more uh, closer to home, let's say. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, by the way, a hot tip if you're interested in greenwashing, just Google greenwashing awards. They are given every year by different environmental NGOs. You find some interesting cases. You may agree or disagree with them, but, but they're interesting to look at. Um, I'm not sure, this is not closer to home, sorry to say, but I think a, a very good greenwashing case that got a lot of publicity was the um, Qatar Football World Championships back in 2022. They claim to be carbon neutral, a net zero event, um, and they used offsetting for that. And then, you know, some NGOs and, and, and just consumers were a little bit suspicious about the methodology behind the offsetting. It wasn't gold standard offsetting, and they weren't exactly cutting emissions to start with. And then I think it was a Swiss authority who looked into it and, and really investigated the, the whole event and, and decided that this was actually greenwashing. But, but what was interesting about this case particularly was that they didn't take into account any of the flights of thousands and thousands of football fans flying to Qatar for the championship. So I think that was a, that was a case that got a lot of publicity and, and yeah, not my favorite way of communicating about sustainability, let's put it that way. Um, uh, just a sec, I, I will also move to Ira and, and have this uh, uh, like government administration view. Um, how do you see that this causes harm? Um, this greenwashing and, and the, the cases, for example, that were uh, brought here. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to um, give a very good example of greenwashing. I made it up myself uh, because to 
yeah, I should be heard, but you can just check it uh, just in case. Um, when you, but uh, anyways, I will. I can um, wait. But anyways, uh, the example that I made up was for the reason that when I mentioned that I will be coming to this meeting today. Uh, my friends started to ask me not how to avoid greenwashing, but they actually asked me, oh, how to do greenwashing, which was <laughs> very uh, peculiar for me. So I made up an example. You do greenwashing when you, for example, uh, lipsticks that you have, you know these hygienic uh, lipsticks, you paint it green, then you make the color a bit light green, and then you say that it has one percentage of, uh, for example, algae, vetica in it. And then you say, you know, it's very green, it has, uh, you know, uh, environmental stuff in it, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Actually, it's a pure greenwashing. Another example of greenwashing is at the highest level that I have seen, which is the United Nations Environment Program, um, Assembly, which is the meeting of all environment ministers of the world. And there we make uh, decisions about uh, the future of uh, the environment uh, globally. And they need to be made by consensus. And what uh, one country, and I can name the country, uh, said there, it was Iran. We were talking about a globally legally binding agreement on plastics because it's a very, very difficult um, issue and a very important one. And they said that, you know, plastics is not a problem. Plastics is actually the way towards sustainability because it helps us so much. So basically, at the highest level, one uh, country was trying to do greenwashing. So that was quite the problem. Uh, but uh, on, the, on behalf of the government, I think the most important thing here is that when you do greenwashing, people who care and who want to care, they will move towards these kind of products, which means that real change is not happening. And they might take away revenue uh, from those products that could be actually green, which means that money flows to the wrong places and we don't have actual change in our environment. And that is a serious problem. Another problem is that when people find out about greenwashing, they will not trust those claims, which means that the money that should be going and the actions that should be going towards um, these kind of uh, things, they will not get done. So uh, when we are doing our sustainable uh, development transition at this moment, and it has a very clear deadline of 2030, then we are moving too slowly and we are not meeting our goals and these goals are for the society. In a smart, educated and science-based um, society, sustainability is actually the norm, not the other way around. So we are cheating ourselves, unfortunately. So what we need to do is uh, speak clearly about this problem, not uh, uh, be too strict at the first sight, because someone might, might make a mistakes, uh, not uh, knowingly, but we also need to address this issue very, 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 very um, much. I think it's one of the most important issues that we need to deal with uh, in the coming years. And we have two regulations that are um, dealing with this. One is for the larger companies that will need to prove how they uh, benefit to the society through environmental and climate goals. They need to. Uh, uh, disclose their revenues related to these uh, goals and they also need to disclose how much they're not doing so that's a, that's a very very good motivation for them to move forward the second one is still in negotiations but it's a directive of green claims and that is for the consumers if anyone says that they are making something green in the future um, they will need to prove it very, very strictly. And if they do not prove it, then there will be consequences. So we are moving towards this. I think in two years, we will be talking all about this issue very much. Thank you, very, very brave statement. And also very topical, this green claim. We will come back to that, actually. Uh, Annela had a comment. Do you still have? Or? I had an example. Yeah, good. I had an example that was close to home. Uh, home means not my, my actual home, but close to Estonia. There's a company in, in the capital that claims that they are CO, their older operations are CO2 neutral. 
and they just flew their entire team over to Italy to work away uh, for a month. So um, not quite what you, that's the more the example of the hidden hidden um, greenwashing. But, um, but, but do you think that in the reports, we don't know that. But uh, the can they get away with that? Just claiming, for example, that uh, uh, what they mean by operations, and then they say that flights with a team are not included in their operations. I don't know. We, we, <laughs> that, we ought to see that next year. I, I, is that about the question of uh, ESG reporting and, and sort of how, how detailed and, and uh, punctual there are, Eva? Yeah, I mean, yes. So, uh, a little bit going back to what Aire said about the regulation that's coming, both the green claims and the uh, corporate sustainability reporting directive, which is upon us very soon, uh, I can see that uh, things are moving forward to a good direction. I mean, the corporate sustainability reporting directive will give more strict guidelines for companies on data points to report on. And those reports need to be third party verified. And uh, you know, we will start treating sustainability data as seriously as we've, as we've been treating financial data, which is great. Because up until now, sustainability reporting has been a bit of, some of the forerunners have been really good at it, uh, while others not so much. And it's been very difficult both for in investors and consumers and B2B customers to understand the differences between companies. So I, I, I see there will be progress for sure. Um, and then I had something else in mind, which I just forgot, sorry. Yeah. Um, so y y you, were, you were referring to these, um, uh, what was it, Co corporate sustainable um, reporting directive? CSRD. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, but how, how it, for example, helps customers, um, for them it's still some claim, they, they cannot see behind it. So obviously there need to be mechanisms that uh, if uh, the company is uh, claiming something uh, in the report, so you said it's third party audited, but it doesn't apply to all companies, is it? Only the big ones. Uh, yeah, it will apply for uh, for other companies as well. So it will happen in waves, but listed companies come first, and then uh, mid-sized companies next. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so maybe just to sort of uh, differentiate between two things. So I think the sustainability reporting directive will bring clarity for comparing companies' overall ESG data and their overall sustainability performance. That will help both investors, analysts, and customers, and if consumers, if you're interested, to, to compare companies, you know, just their data, basically. That it's calculated in the same way and that they're reporting the right things. They can no longer select themselves which things to report on, as the mining companies used to do 15 years ago when they didn't say a word about biodiversity. Now, with the new regulation, they will have to report on all kinds of material things, which they cannot define themselves. Great. But then when it comes to consumers and marketing claims and greenwashing, you know, the stuff we see when we go to a supermarket and every washing powder is eco-friendly, haha, -ha, you know, there the green claim regulation comes in. And, you know, there now it's being discussed in the European Parliament as we speak, but the, if you look at the, the um, proposal by the European Commission, which was issued uh, in March this year, it... As Aira said, it lays out very strict rules for companies for using these claims. And those claims have to be based on science. They ha also have to be third party verified. They have to be specific. You can't just say, we are an eco-friendly company. Oh no, you have to say which part of your value chain is eco-friendly or which part of your product or service is eco or not eco-friendly, but you know what does it do specifically? And uh, also that information has to be found very close to your product or service so that Consumers don't have to go to Google and spend hours and hours Googling. So, again, positive things coming up. So th there will be a lot of uh, regulations coming in to uh, clear out this mess, let's, let's say. Um, does it also has, uh, then, uh, apparently it has to have uh, a link to this carbon offsetting uh, uh, they were ma mentioning several times here, uh, on uh, yourself also, that um, uh, 
this is most often what companies use uh, when they want to claim that they are carbon neutral. They do the stuff as, as, as usual, business as usual, and then they uh, buy credits from some uh, offsetting project and in Africa, in Asia, wherever they get the cheapest credits. Um, and, and that validates, in a way, their green claim. So um, these offset markets, uh, AIRA, how, how do you, from the government and administration viewpoint, uh, how do you see these offset, voluntarily offset markets are being regulated and, 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 and the claims companies make from there are also then covered by the Green Claim Directive, or? Yes, so um, I think that it's still... Okay, I... Because the mic is not working. Ei jakka. Okay. Uh, it's a microphone that, that will not work. But uh, yeah, I think one thing is uh, important here when we talk about terms, and it's very important uh, that we talk about definitions as well. Um, the, the thing that uh, also Madis mentioned that I did in the United Nations was a resolution on nature-based solutions. And the reason for this resolution was exactly greenwashing, to avoid greenwashing, because a lot of large uh, countries use uh, their words like uh, it's nature-based, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but they're actually, you know, destroying nature uh, by uh, taking these uh, nature-based uh, things that they do, and then it actually hinders the development of nature. So we needed to agree upon a definition. Now, in the European Union, the definition for uh, environmentally sustainable has been defined by now. It means that you. Uh, cause no harm to any of six environmental and climate uh, uh, objectives. So that is not only climate, it is climate mitigation, uh, uh, climate um, um, reducing CO2, uh, water management and sea management. It is also the protection of uh, biodiversity and it is circular economy. So there are six objectives that go under environmentally sustainable. And these are those that are regulated by this green claims uh, proposal as well as by this uh, corporate sustainability and disclosure regulation. So you can't do any harm to any of these when you want to say you're environmentally sustainable and you have to uh, do good to one or several of them. About this um, offsetting, uh, it's uh, an example perhaps from a different uh, area of work. Um, for example, te textiles. Textile sector is the second most polluting sector in the world. And the uh, average person in the EU uh, wears uh, in a year 26 uh, kilograms of new textiles. Now, I don't know whether you know or not that to produce one kilogram of textiles, you use three kilograms of chemicals. I don't know why so many, but it was a, a miracle for me to understand that. And now then there is the question whether these chemicals will stay in Bangladesh or somewhere else, or am I wearing them actually? And uh, what companies, lo some larger companies do, they say that, you know, when you buy something, they will uh, take these uh, materials back when you have used them, and it is go all green. But actually, they are still using these chemicals. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's a green claim. Uh, what we are doing to CO2 setting for many years, the European Commission didn't want to work on this issue because it's a very delicate issue. But now they have presented a regulation for this and each country will need to set up uh, a system to uh, regulate CO2 offsetting by some kind of a framework or some kind of um, uh, authorities uh, that will look at the market, which is at this moment, it's Wild West, as you have said. Yeah, you have something to add on offsetting part? Wild West being regulated? Just just offsetting. Offsetting is when you find like this really, really difficult for you to reduce emissions. Uh, and then you find some another place where it's easier to do and it's cheaper for you. That's that's the if it's honestly done, there's nothing wrong as long as you still keep reducing your emissions yourself as a company. Um, but, or, or a person also, but it's just the, the way it's done is like if it's outside the, for example, in the EU, the EU regulatory frameworks, then if it's not 
um, there's no standard or not monitored, not verified, then this can become a, a problem, or if it's done at a very bad quality. So um, there's more stricter regulations, for example, the European e Emissions Trading System, where it's more strictly like monitored, verified, and reported. It starts with reporting, monitoring, reporting, and verifying the system is placed. Voluntary offset that we're talking about here can have these systems if you find a company, like we have Gold Standard, Vera, and others, who can actually do this for you, and you pay for them. But there are also many offset where that is not done. And this is why EU now, due, due to carbon farming, is trying to, trying to set up a framework, a standard, EU-wide standard, that makes it easier to create offset, but also that makes possible to trust what is done. So you can monitor, report, monitor, and verify those emissions. Monitor, report, and verify, yeah, that's the MRV is the right order. So this is why this system is, will, is being created. This system will be only EU-wide, so you can't trade those offset with other countries. To, in order to encourage companies to take more action and make it easier for them. But that should not be an excuse for not reducing emissions. Um, that's, that's the danger there. For example, some oil companies are very interested in that. That scheme now. But, but, but often it is the case because it's, it's much easier, it's much cheaper to offset than actually reduce in, in uh, business operations. I mean, uh, I just uh, bring this uh, silly example, but um, uh, yeah, I think it was SAS. Um, they uh, urged me to uh, um, take on new flights because uh, every flight I take is. Uh, is uh, carbon neutral, so that they have offset all, all, all my footprint. It's like, how this, I mean, this is not possible. Th this doesn't work in the end, e even if they calculate in a way that, that I, uh, for example, uh, emit uh, uh, one ton uh, CO2, and then they uh, have this project somewhere in Africa. Um, theoretically, the trees that they plant in some years' time, will absorb some amount, but it's it's theoretical because, I mean, this uh, amount of emissions that I emit with my air travel are already there now uh, in this stock of of carbon in the atmosphere, and how much these trees that they planted uh, would actually over the years be able to uh, balance that out. I mean, it's. It's so theoretical. <laughs> and of, often these trees actually die and no one takes care of them. That's, that has yeah. been an issue. There are examples. Of because it, uh, otherwise it, it, it could be so easy. I mean, th there was even a, a figure put down that uh, um, how much uh, it would cost to uh, offset the whole... Um, was it... It was a British uh, uh, BP... British Petroleum, is it? So they have a new name now. Oh. Yeah. Um, anyway, they, 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 they uh, put a price, like uh, how much it would cost that all of their operations would be CO2 neutral. And that wasn't a big sum of money. So it, it just doesn't sort of work out in my mind. <coughs> yeah, I think, I think consumers and the society at large is becoming more critical towards offsetting. Not to say that there is anything wrong with offsetting if it's done in the right way, using the right methodology. Absolutely, yes. But if we have a customer... Now, my specialty is sustainability communications. That's what I've been doing for more than 15 years. But if we have a customer who comes to Milton for advice for cutting emissions, we won't re recommend offsetting. It will be the last resort. It will be the last step on your emissions journey. It won't be the first step by any means, even using the best methodology. So, and, and when it comes to sustainability communications, I think, again, I think it, it's becoming more and more difficult for companies to make these claims that, hey, we're carbon neutral. We've been doing nothing about our direct emissions, but we're offsetting. I, I don't think that's, that's the future. And... Um, when it comes to greenwashing and the problem of greenwashing, which we started with um, in the beginning, 
I'm, I'm so happy for the Green Claims Directive and, and the fact that we're talking about these things more and more, like we're doing right here, right now, because, you know, there are companies who are, quote unquote, doing the right thing. They're investing in clean technology, investing in cutting their emissions, and then maybe using a little bit of offsetting where they cannot, you know, cut their emissions effectively for now. Uh, but then there are companies who can make exactly the same environmental claims in their communications and marketing without doing th that same thing, without making that investment. And it is so unfair for companies. And it's really taking the motivation out from companies for making th those uh, investments. And when the business driver for green transition is missing, it's a problem. But again, we see some positive development in here, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I thought I would take it later on, but maybe if, if we already have spoken so much about this green claims uh, directive, uh, I see that you uh, lay great hopes for this new legislation, uh, both Aira and, and Eva. Uh, I don't know about uh, Annela so much, but a little bit hesitant. Mm. But um, I, I will then take it now. This green claim directive, um, in a way, restricts a certain type of language that companies are being able to use. Is it so? So that if, for example, um, a company says they are eco-friendly, says they uh, are that the products are CO2 free or CO2 neutral, uh, so they have to undergo. Uh, a certain verified procedures, third-party auditing um, to be entitled to use these specific words. And I suppose these will be then translated to all uh, like national languages. Um, for me, it's like, uh, it, it certainly a little bit uh, clears and, and levels the playing ground. Um, but uh, I would think that it's, it's still quite, I mean, creative minds in the companies, they can, you know, invent some new nice words because you, you cannot maybe patent in the commission like every word. It will be so restrictive, isn't it? I mean, if, if I, I don't know, is there, do you know the list of the terms or words that uh, need verification if you say these? I mean, if just company says that we're green, <laughs> does it need to be certified? If a company says that uh, we're good, yeah. do, we're do climate good, for example. I mean, I'm just drawing in and some... You know, you know what's even funnier, uh, in the beginning, when Annela was explaining what carbon uh, negative and carbon positive means, uh, what's even more confusing is that many, many companies say we are climate positive <laughs> in their marketing. <laughs> but, Aire, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? I can start. Uh, so, um, yeah, indeed, it's, it's the same actually for the EU uh, Sustainable Actions Taxonomy, which is for, uh, for uh, uh, economic sectors. So each economic sector, for, for example, forestry, agriculture, industry, mining, etc., etc., has its own classification system, and they don't have to use it. But the second you say that you are environmentally sustainable, you will need to use it and you will need to also uh, invest back uh, the gains that you um, uh, gather from uh, revenues uh, back to, uh, so to say, eco-friendly activities. It's the same principle for the Green Claims Directive. If you want to say that you are in some ways green, then you will need to prove it. But it's also fair because, for example, uh, we already have the eco-labels. An eco-label on a product uh, states that this product has been um, sustainably produced, uh, it does no harm to human health, etc. And to get this label, you actually have to go through a verification system. This will just be a higher level or lower level, one can uh, discuss this, but it will be similar to the eco label, but it will be uh, in a much broader sense. Uh, but I think these uh, questions will arise, and I would like to hear Eva your <laughs> answer. Perhaps I am uh, not uh, correct at this moment. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it's it's a proposal that's in the parliament right now, and we 
it's going to be a directive, hopefully, and then it's going to be one day national legislation. So we don't know exactly what the national legislation is going to look like in Estonia or in Finland or in Sweden or in other EU countries. So it's it's too early to answer that question about the words lists. But But just the principle that you have to prove your claims, uh, I think it's a positive uh, advancement. And I also think, you know, for sure, you, companies will continue to be creative in their marketing communications, but I don't think forerunner companies or, or ambitious companies are consciously trying to trick and fool consumers or their customers. Um, I think for many companies this will bring relief. I know that because we've actually at Milton we've carried a survey among our customers. Um, we had a green claims event um, this last spring, and we asked our we had some 150 customers present, and we asked them, "Do you think uh, the green claims directive is a threat or an opportunity?" And 100% of the respondents said it will be an opportunity. And then we asked them why, and they said because it will set the rules, it will make it clear for everyone how, how to behave on the market. And it's also a way to protect companies from greenwashing claims when they, you know, how to play the game, more or less. Maybe Milton's customers are forerunners in their field and a little bit more sophisticated in terms of, you know, their sustainability performance, maybe. But I, I'm not sure if it's a representative survey result, but still, you know, at least our customers are, are perceiving this in a very positive way. Uh, Annelle, what, what, what's your take on, on this uh, uh, specifically green claims uh, directive, but also this uh, uh, corporate sustainable sustainability uh, reporting uh, directive? Um, w would they like not only help, but uh, uh, make, it, make it all nice and, and uh, transparent and, and trustworthy? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's a move to that direction, to be transparent and trustworthy. Um, but why it's really important. Um, so, a recent IPCC report says that consumers with their behavior can reduce 50 to, to 70 percent of CO2, CO2 emissions by 2050. So, if people change their behavior, chose the products that are carbon neutral or carbon free, or consumed less. So in order to choose those products, you have to trust those products, isn't it? That would help this to happen. Um, um, and uh, you know, it, it is a move to the right direction. So how do I know? It's, it's actually the product I buy is CO2 neutral. So that will help, and that means that things will actually happen, not just like, oh, I feel I did something, and actually you know, it didn't help. Uh, I just uh, have this proposal. Let's do an instant poll, but just raising your hand. Um, let's say that these green uh, claim directives in a few years to come, it will be implemented nationally. Uh, we have the taxonomy in place. Um, how many of you would trust green claims from companies? Yes, yes. Um, who will trust the green claims from companies? Raise your hand. There are a few people. Yeah. Uh, raise your hand uh, who will not trust. Maybe a little bit more. And then raise your hand. Uh, if you just don't care about what they say. You, <laughs> you, you just buy a product that you need and that's fit to your wallet. No one. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, I don't know how representative this uh, instant poll was, uh, but uh, it gives kind of, a, at least, let's say people are hesitant. Uh, uh, it, it is so complicated, these uh, calculations behind, uh, um, I mean, you, you, you um, brought this example of, uh, of Verra, which is uh, the, the global, the biggest uh, carbon credit uh, 
certifier, is it? Yeah, not provider, certifier. And uh, th there are major companies who have clients, and, and there I just um, quite recently had this huge scandal where uh, I think also scientists from Cambridge were involved, um, where um, the, the, the study, the research showed that it was some 90% of their projects, offset projects, that did not deliver. And this is huge. <laughs> this is the, the biggest global certifier. And then, of course, um, a, a big, big, big uh, row and discussion broke out uh, whether one methodology is, is better than the other. And, and then this all, in a way, fades in this... Uh, discussions between scientists and, and the audience is pretty much, you know, left with empty hands like, come on, just, you know, say something, what's right, what's wrong. So it is, it is very complicated to make up a mind as, as a consumer uh, with these green claims. Do you agree? Whoever wants to agree or not agree. I, I, I can uh, comment uh, based on uh, an experience from the Ministry of Climate. We created uh, this climate calculator, it's on the web page. If you want to check, uh, for example, uh, which, uh, which kind of fuels you use when you drive a car or which kind of uh, electricity you are uh, using or, or how, you even how you sort your waste, it uh, impacts uh, very clearly uh, the CO2 emissions. And to come to this uh, calculation by the government. It's not official, it's unofficial, 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 etc. All these um, disclaimers are there, but it's uh, for, um, to make it easier for the enterprise. But even there, we needed a year to just discuss these calculations, whether they are correct, whether they're not correct. So it's difficult, but this is where the state needs to come and help a bit. Uh, we can make it more trustworthy when we create these kind of tools. At least at some stages it's validated as a medium. Like, I would say that, I don't know. <coughs> can I offer a completely different perspective mm -hmm. <laughs> on the question? Um, yes, it's difficult for consumers to understand all of this, but it's also difficult for people in companies who are not sustainability experts or environmental engineers or scientists to understand these things. And I was recently asked if I think greenwashing happens because people, marketing people, want to lie and deceive their customers. They just want to, you know, trick customers. And I have never seen that happen. What I have seen happen is that you have a sales or marketing director who wants to get a product on the market and there is a rush and they talk to their marketing colleagues and they're like, and you know, the, the sales director says, hey, this is so much more sustainable than the competitor's product or service or whatever. And then the marketeer gets creative and, you know, we see the end result um, on the market. Um, it, it's, it doesn't happen out of bad will. It's done in good faith many times. So they just have a hunch that it's good. Yeah, yeah and, and also I, I can see how if you're a sales director in a company and you see what your competition is doing on the market in terms of marketing and communications and you know for a fact that your product or service is more sustainable, it's produced with renewable energy or whatnot, you get frustrated and you feel like, hey, I gotta be... I, I gotta tell people, you know, and, and my, my message has to be stronger and louder and I have to come up with stronger words uh, for sustainability to make people believe this. And, and then, you know, we know what the end result looks like. So this is something I see happening rather than anybody acting out of bad will. But then when I, when I recently said this in a podcast, uh, there was a representative from the Finnish Association of uh, Consumer Protection and she said... Maybe, but there is some direct bad will as well, because if 53% of green claims made in the European market, according to European Commission study, are misleading, it cannot just be a row of accidents. So maybe it's a variety of reasons. I don't know, but, but just going back to your question, I think it's difficult for everybody. So in your... Um, I mean, you haven't been too long in that consultancy, but... Uh, what I was about to ask uh, is that, have you had this personal experience that the company comes in, wants to have 
um, wants to become more sustainable. And then they realize during the process, well, the operations are not maybe that fit with all those um, goals. And then they, you know, tell you that, can, you, can we just make it, you know, somehow look like? Do you have that experience? I have an experience where um, a customer has come to me and my colleagues with a proposal for marketing and we said to them that, hey, I think we need a life cycle assessment to make great marketing communications for you that are safe and future proof and will protect your brand. And in the beginning, the customer was a bit like, huh? <laughs> but then they had an internal discussion and came back to us and were they were super happy that we brought up that issue because we are, in fact, protecting their brand from accusations, from you know, um, any kind of negative uh, publicity. So I personally think that some level of sustainability knowledge and understanding is a new skill set that all communications and marketing experts need to adopt in the future or they won't have jobs anymore. And I also think that Within companies, sustainability, communications and marketing experts, maybe people from sales and R&D, need to work more closely together going forward. Uh, we, are, we cannot live in isolation anymore. Um, you cannot do marketing without talking to your sustainability colleagues at least a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. Annalie. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, just thinking back, um, you know, at your bowl, you just started, yeah, and the kind of the feeling of mistrust, yeah. I think there's a lot of trust building to do. Um, and it's not easy, given the bad experiences. And the basis for that will be education, understanding, you know, teaching consumers to ask the right questions. So, for example, if I say the word, or the, you know, the words uh, life cycle assessment, how many people actually know the meaning of those? Yeah, we can have another poll here. Yeah. See, no, yeah. we had probably seven, six, seven, eight hands coming up mm. here now. It's it's just like you know, so you understand. Life cycle assessment means that from you know throughout the life cycle, the, throughout the production of a product, that means if you use, for example, steel, you know, the mining of iron ore will be zero emissions, or the transport, transporting this from China to Finland needs to be also checked and covered, and so on. All, all little steps in your production need to be like meet this criteria. And this is not easy. It's not easy to understand. It's even more difficult to do. Um, but then, you know, education, talking about these things, building trust will be extremely important, mm. I think. I, I was about to come to that LCA maybe shortly. But meanwhile, I will ask. If you have any questions to Annela, Eva, Aire. I have problem with offsetting, if you can understand, because I think it's a little bit uh, justifies uh, uh, pollution that you say, I'm going to pollute, but I'm going to offset. For example, there is almost impossible to prove that if that forest was planted, it would have been planted anyways without the offsetting or that company or or if the forest burns down, is it counted as carbon emission that that project made instead of like offsetting? They only calculate what they plant and then that's it, in my opinion, as much as I know. Response. Yeah, um, we often can verify that or the companies can that it was planted. If it survives, it's more difficult. Um, I mean, the forest of the trees you were referring to. But is, is, um, offsetting has to meet certain criteria. And as Eva said, it has to be last resort. So you have to reduce, do everything to reduce emissions. And they, they're just a tiny bit you can't do. Well, Not I'll, yet. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's easier, and again, like, you know, the trust is gone because of, or damaged because of the bad examples. But then it's better to show that they are polluting, uh, so they can change themselves. Be honest. Yeah, be honest and <laughs> yeah, but offsetting has to meet certain criteria. There has a very, it has to be, there has to be additionality. But there was the case, 
and there has to be permanence. Um, and, and these two are really most important because additionality is that these things need to happen due to deliberate action. It shouldn't happen on its own. And if it happens on its own, you know, if the forest would grow there anyway, or would have been planted there anyway, this is not offsetting. It shouldn't mm -hmm. qualify. Yep. Yeah, mm. th then it's wrong, and then you know it damages trust. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Another question. Uh, yes, uh, t talking about greenwashing and and uh, life uh, cycle span. Uh, I think also one problem for the consumers is that not even official statistics uh, are trustworthy. Since uh, you mentioned, and it's mentioned always when you talk about this uh, also in media, is uh, flying. And if, as we know, flying now, now account for, for a little bit less than 2% uh, than of the CO2 uh, emissions. While, for example, uh, cloud services and computing is uh, almost uh, uh, double. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, at least 3%. And it's growing. Uh, while aviation probably is, is going down. Now I don't uh, uh, want to, 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 to defend in any way aviation. But, uh, but when you then, uh, when, it, when for example, uh, uh, trains and, and aviation are compared, and then you are only counting what we see, we consumers, we only see the CO2 emissions for the service, not uh, what we should see, and that is material input per service. Mm -hmm. And then the figures are totally, totally different because, uh, because uh, at the, the railway is such an old innovation, so you need a lot of iron ore in order, and it's very, very <laughs> uh, uh, bad thing, of course, as we know, to, to dig that out and then transport it to a military and then cut uh, t trees in the forest in order to put all this uh, steel uh, all around uh, the countries. But this is not accounted for in the official uh, 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 figures at, at all. In Finland, it was done some, it's quite a long time ago uh, this, uh, by the uh, Ministry of the Environment and uh, uh, MIPS, uh, Material Input per Service uh, 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 Research. And it was quite amazing what it showed. And, and uh, the, the, the railway service, they did very poorly actually there. While, for example, flying, because they don't need to, to have roads, uh, uh, a road work network all over, just uh, landing, and then, uh, then the airplane itself is very light, because otherwise it wouldn't uh, fly, while a train has to be very heavy, otherwise it wouldn't uh, uh, stay on, 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 on the rails. And this is not taken in, into account at all. And, but very few people know about it. Uh, and it's the same whatever we have. If it is water, uh, I mean, we know that uh, water in a plastic bottle is not good. It's much better to take it in a, in a glass or, or, or uh, at least in, in this kind of a bottle that you use uh, many times. But this is not taking into account. And I think that, uh, that nothing is really trustworthy unless you, 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 you can do it. By the way, in this uh, uh, MIPS uh, uh, research, uh, the poorest uh, and most destroying one in Finland was uh, these, uh, when, uh, uh, these uh, new roads that are made for, for bikers. And, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, the explanation is very easy, because it's so few people that use it compared to uh, other services. I like biking, and I'm not supporting uh, uh, flying very much either, but I would love to have... have have comparable, decent, reliable figures as a, as a, as a consumer. Yeah, so, so what would be this sort of universal measure, this uh, unit of sustainability, if we, if we see that uh, CO2 only shows us uh, one side, uh, there is material consumption, the whole LCA uh, with other pollution issues, uh, what is this measure that we should be looking for? So that if you see this, uh, whatever, how, how, it's, how it's called, um, type of uh, certificate, then you know that, okay, this is all good. Not only climate good, but this is all good. Do we have this universal measure coming up from somewhere? Yes. 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> no, I just wanted to comment uh, about another initiative that uh, we have, and uh, a lot of problems, I agree, are with relation to data. So what we need to do for the consumers as well as for ourselves is the digital sustainability passport that would go with the product. I think it will be there in the future. It's uh, from the European Commission, an initiative that is uh, taking place. Unfortunately, it will take a few years, but I think in the future you will have both the price and the sustainability in uh, on the product and you can decide based on this but on the complex issues I, I just think I think that the taxonomy and green claims uh, initiatives they have started this because many uh, of our partners have also said that uh, only CO2 is not enough they want to see water they want to see circularity they want to see pollution and biodiversity protection and this is what the taxonomy regulation actually uh, brought to us for example I will give you an example it's really difficult. You can have the perfect house with perfect heating and perfect uh, parameters, but when you put it on valuable soil, then it's still doing harm. So you need to even consider these kind of uh, issues. So uh, I agree with Eva that we will need in the future sustainability people who know about digitalization, who know about the environment, who know about economics, and who have this overall uh, life cycle um, uh, approach in their head for every decision. Yep. Can I just throw in a super random comment? Uh, you asked if there is a definition for um, a universally sustainable, overall sustainable um, solution. And just going back to the example of um, planes versus trains, you, you know, we, we still cannot leave out the social responsibility element either, because if my employer asks me to take a train to travel to a fair in Berlin, it's going to take me several days of my private time and family life. And, you know, I, I think we still have to think about the social elements as well. That was a random comment. But then um, going back to what Ira said, I think, and, and to this sort of competence question, I think probably all professions out there need to uh, become more conscious on sustainability issues. We probably need to raise the awareness and information of sustainability, if, if not in all, then at least most professions that we have in the society. Um, otherwise, we, we cannot make the green transition. We, we don't have the capacity, the competence to do that. Uh, do you... Um, oh, yeah, question, Selga. Yeah. Um, I was very curious about the whole accountability aspect of it because, I mean, we've seen that sometimes the offsetting is not as nice as it actually seems. So I was curious if there's any regulations for how long you have to, for example, take accountability, say, for a field of forest that you planted and if biodiversity is taken into account because um, I personally am very interested in um, rewilding. So I was wondering if there's um, offsetting that is done, for example, by rewilding. Just because, maybe for context, just because um, just planting something, and I'm sure you all know that, that just planting something doesn't necessarily do much in terms of carbon sequestration because the biodiversity that actually sequesters the carbon is simply not there if you just plant a singular you tree. You could plant monocultures, like, yeah. Usually it's planting monocultures, actually, has been so far. So rewilding, yeah, rewilding actually, if it additionality, it would probably meet the criteria depending on the project. But then the requirement of um, creating close to nature ecosystem, I, I'm not aware, but I think it, it sounds like a good idea, but it, it might be the case, but I'm not just aware of that. But I think it's a very good way of thinking. And before the you know, the consumption of steel, life cycle analysis, looking at water, it, that requires systems thinking. And we have lost over the years systems thinking. People work in silos, they're very specialized. And now climate change is such a complex problem, as Ira said, and uh, it was that it requires a lot of different people, a lot of different skills, a lot of knowledge. Um, so that's that, that what makes it really difficult, isn't it? It's not like, you know, if you're trained as an economist, you can tackle it on your own. And the other issue is the balance, uh, as Eva mentioned, that 
um, there's so many of us, us, by us I mean people, um, so you're bound to lose something, either in your own well-being, your economic um, well-being or social well-being, or then in nature. So where is the right balance is the question also. And I think the train example is very good. In the UK, there was a study a couple of years, more than a couple of years ago now, that actually found per unit of output the most environmentally unfriendly industry was tourism. So you couldn't imagine even that. But it is like the most CO2 intensive, uh, water wasting, and so on. But people don't care. You go to a hotel, you leave your lights on, you, you know, wash your hair twice as long. And, and so on and so forth. And then next one comes in next day, the sheets change, new towels, and you need, these need to be washed, ironed, and so on. And per unit of output, it was most CO2 intensive. Uh, I, I ju uh, just to add on that, that uh, I have seen minor um, restoration, rewilding uh, projects. Uh, so they're coming, but they're not that big. And uh, I think especially this regenerative agriculture is coming quite strong also in Europe. Uh, now the, the sort of carbon farming thing, they're trying to work out uh, uh, first to like certify um, how much and how it will actually work sequestering more carbon into, uh, into the soils uh, uh, with the help of biodiversity. So it, there are developments actually. Yep. Uh, when it comes to this uh, regenerative agriculture, for example, um, then what, what I have heard is the difficulties in measuring because uh, uh, this is not uh, an actual sheet. This is uh, soil is, is a living organism. Uh, in, in the handful of soil, as they say, there are more living organisms than there are humans on the planet. Uh, and and it's, it's very difficult to um, precisely determine what will happen, what will be the consequences if, uh, you know, the weather changes that much, uh, you have a uh, little bit droughts. droughts. Um, so it, it is very complex. So the, I think they have difficulties there. This will soon become super academic <laughs> discussion, so I'll, I will try to keep it light. Um, yeah, but, but just, just want to throw in one example. I mean, I worked in the forest industry for more than 13 years, and the company I worked for was restoring lots and lots of rainforest in Bahia, Brazil, and being able to bring back endangered species such as jaguars to the, to the rainforest, which had disappeared years and years ago. Great work, amazing work. But on the other hand, they also plant <laughs> eucalyptus trees, uh, which are monocultures. And, uh, and there are local farmers who say that this land should be used for farming, not for rainforest restoration or for growing eucalyptus trees. So I think also that just a global battle for land and the land use issues that we have in the global south are just so super difficult and so sort of linked to social justice and social responsibility questions, a very difficult sort of balance to strike right. Uh, but if you're interested, look up the, um, the project that forestry companies have carried out, especially in Brazil and Uruguay. They are so cool, yet from certain angles, problematic. Yeah, I also have a comment. I want to give some positive or optimism. Uh, I'm also working on the soil directive that was presented th this year in the summer. And it's all about land use and uh, protecting uh, soil because you are very true. 25% of biodiversity is actually in soils. And soil is also the largest uh, carbon sink uh, uh, on land. And uh, what uh, I'm mentoring is this initiative that uh, this is a cool project because one guy uh, made pictures of its garden for five years in a row in every five minutes in Estonia, in Huma. And, and uh, what he's trying to do, they're trying to create an AI that will now uh, help in other places to develop biodiverse systems that are best for these places, including for reforesting. So I think that these things are coming, and uh, they're coming quite fast. Yeah, there is a question. Hi, I'm sorry, I actually have two questions. 
Um, on a practical note, and since we've been talking about trust and everything, I am that consumer who goes out of my way to Google to make sure that I have the confidence in whatever I'm buying. And I do make that extra effort, but I see I'm definitely the minority, not a majority. So any tricks and trips you can share, what you do to do a product check and whether the claims that are being made, you know, if you use any apps, if you have any websites that you know you can trust. And my second question would be that we already a little bit, uh, you mentioned that in the future, for example, that any materials and anything would have like digital identities or that sort to help, you know, to make greenwashing impossible, but how do we make sure in the future that the technology we use to minimize the greenwashing harm doesn't actually cause more environmental harm, you know? Because if I think about adding a digital identity to every resource, material, and everything, and if, you know, how much backlash there is already about computing, energy use, and all that, so. And is it even possible, or is that where we're gonna get stuck? Thank you. Someone wants to take the question. If, if I start and then colleagues yeah. uh, fill in, <laughs> because there, there were so many questions. Uh, you know, just to be honest, sometimes after a long week at the office and I go to the supermarket, <laughs> I just don't have the energy. <laughs> we are human beings, right? And maybe I'm naive, but I still have a certain level of trust on certain eco-labels, such as the EU flower, um, such as FSC and PFC for a certification, um, because I know them, I know how they work. And, and then, you know, I, I just buy the same stuff, because, you know, there is just a certain amount of time in, in a person's life. So that, that would be my <laughs> trick, <laughs> sort of rely on the labels that are transparent and that you can sort of personally audit. Yeah, if you be, want to be really on the safe side, just consume as little as possible and reuse yeah. things. That's, that's, that's like the safest, then you know for sure. And that is most effective also. That's why I'm taking my research so seriously because the reason why I'm buying it means that I am actually on my last last that I have made sure that I really need it and I need to find a product that's gonna last me for two decades, three decades. That's not, that's, that was the idea behind it. Like how do I identify the one that you know is gonna last me a lifetime now? Oh. <coughs> I don't have an answer to that, but uh, what I can agree is that I just, uh, today in the morning, I also thought about how to be sustainable if I were to be fully sustainable. And the things that I do are the, the same that you just mentioned. When I buy something, I have a jacket. I didn't bring it here, but it's been for 15 years. It's the first thing that I bought when I was a student and I got some money. And it's still there. I will not show it because my colleagues will know which jacket it is. It's, quality, so buy once, but buy quality. So then you can be a bit sustainable. On the digital side, I agree that uh, this issue needs to be tackled. When we were negotiating this uh, issue, then um, a large part of uh, countries actually, uh, we found it positive to have this digital passport, but uh, many countries found that you know it's a threat and then we will have so many servers, etc. energy consumption. So uh, it needs to be tackled, but I don't think that it should be put on pause because of this, but I think it needs to be acknowledged. I don't know if it was a... And I think one more thing, super quickly. Um, more and more consumer goods companies are coming up with repairing services. Like it's a new business model. If you buy a really good quality pot or pan for your home, for example, or um, sports gear or, or clothing, I mean, if you buy it from a brand that offers repairing services, hopefully close to you so that you don't have to sell, you know, send it to India, um, that's a positive sign. It's not a guarantee, but it's a positive sign for sure. To add to that, there are more renting coming available also, so you can rent your clothes, you can rent stuff you need at home, and then return it, and the company will either reuse it, resell it, or 
or recycled. But that is this is still hard work, still a long way to go to get the. Yeah. And, and here again, I think uh, European Commission uh, comes to help us. Uh, they uh, and they have a requirement for companies that uh, spare parts need to be available for, for ten years. Was it after the end of the production, something like that? So. It's again, we're relying on the European Commission. And we take the last question, I think. Well, not a question, just a small comment about this cloud computing and stuff like that. They mentioned it a few times, so I just wanted to mention that there are also changes in that domain as well. Like you have new languages that they use less, uh, basically, resources. Computer servers, they become more intelligent. Like when they, are not, they don't get any requests, basically, they turn off. Hardware, there was so, a huge improvement also for that. So it's not like a uh, few years ago, basically. Just that. Yeah, that's good yeah. to know. Thanks. Um, okay, since that was not the question, I take the last question. <laughs> yeah, my question is actually if maybe it's more ideology maybe it's more ideal in that sense, what's in my head. But companies have this constant need for growth. They have investors, they're in stock market, they need to grow, 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 they need to make more money. So how does, like, is there possible to make some sort of ideological switch that growth means also something else than just money? Because I feel as long as we're after money all the time, can we actually be sustainable at the same time? Yeah, I, that's of course a, a very deep question. I didn't want to open that myself. Uh, it would be an uh, totally entire, I think, day we can spend on that. But if you want to have quick, um, you know, company growing on an infinite planet, how much economic growth we can have? Okay, let's we'll start. Uh, I think we have a lot of room uh, for uh, reducing uh, resources used. Um, there is an innovation, again, an idea by my colleague uh, who's working on it. And it's a very, very interesting one where they use all of these resources uh, again and again and, and again. The nutrients, the water, even uh, gas, uh, the air, um, they have created a unique system that basically is self preservant and it's producing uh, both plants as well as both nutrients. And I think we have a large, large gap that we are not using because we are not thinking in the manner that you just said. We're thinking about the economical terms, but there is a large potential for circularity when you design the systems in a different manner. So without designing systems in a different manner, yes, it will be growth. But when you design them differently, you can also have more money because uh, the system that he designed is uh, designed to make money eventually. So I think that at this moment, the linear economy has such a large gap that we can use actually in the future to uh, reduce uh, uh, use of uh, resources just by creative thinking. Yeah, I would have probably said the same. I think circular economy is probably the best solution we can bring to the table today. Uh, but then maybe just a, there, ha there has been a light switch. This is not answering to your call, but many listed companies in their financial statements and interim reports nowadays don't just report on their you know, revenues and different financial figures, but they also report on their CO2 emissions and you know, diversity numbers and occupational health and safety numbers like accidents. I mean, sustainability reporting has become mainstream also for financial statements and you know, maybe it's a, it's a small switch. Maybe it's, it's a step to the right direction. Maybe I can say something of it looking at sort of larger economic growth. I think that was your question was about. Um, so not, not a company, but I, I don't know whether, you know, probably ever knows that probably are companies that don't focus on, on profits uh, only, but or even happy to give up some of the profits they could make. 
but if we're looking at countries or GDP or sort of general economic growth, um, we have to be cautious there. If you start suppressing growth just to meet the environmental requirements, then we actually have chosen very slippery paths because at the moment we need very large amount of investments. And, and I have a news for you, money comes from economic activity, from companies. So um, we ask, just have to make the right decisions about investments and not to suppress growth. Um, so if we have made the right decisions, there might be a time when we actually can start suppressing growth, economic growth. And we have to also keep in mind that there are many countries that still need to grow in order to do, enable decent life quality to their citizens. There's around 100,000 uh, million people living, still living in absolute poverty and they're in hunger, so we need to think of that. So I think growth on its own is not bad, depends what, where this growth comes from, really. You can have a growth, might be a, have a growth that actually is good. Yeah, so uh, uh, just to, I think, now wrap it up, uh, uh, if you don't have anything like final, final to say. Um, so as I understood, um, you, you pointing to the growth from the perspective that if the good things, the good companies are growing, then uh, it should be encouraged and fostered. And uh, luckily enough, we have a lot of regulations uh, coming from at least the European Commission that uh, will tell us which are the companies that are, in a way, entitled to grow. Um, so in that sense, uh, there is uh, light in the tunnel. And the bad ones should be investing to, into becoming yeah. good. So that was the yeah. point. <laughs> and we all have agency here. We are all citizens and consumers. There's so much we can do. It's not just everything coming from the European Commission, but just the fact that we're here to talk about greenwashing means that we have some agency and we care. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Annela, Eva, Aire. Warm applause. So thank you very much for being such an engaging audience with interesting topical questions. See you later somewhere. Thank you.